going to talk about this afternoon is about Java, but it's also about cars, because I consider myself to be a real geek. I like all things technical, but I also consider myself to be what we call in the UK a petrol head, because I really like cars as well. And so in this project, I've actually combined these two things that I really like into one particular thing. And what I have here at the front is, is what I've kind of come up with. I think we've got it there. That's the button to press. Got it. Right, so let's start by talking a little bit about cars and computers. <coughs> so here is my first car. This goes way back to 1981. I had a Mini. In fact, it was a Mini Clubman 1000. And I was 17 when I got this car, and I was very, very proud of this car. When I look at this car now, what I can safely say is that it had no electronics in it at all. Well, actually, that's not strictly speaking true. It had one thing that I would classify as electronics, which was the radio. That is until it was stolen. And then it really did have no electronics in it at all. Everything on that car was what we would describe as electromechanical. And this is what you had sort of 30, 40 years ago. So it had in terms of the ignition system, it had things called points. Anybody here remember points? No? Okay. Uh, it had a distributor. It had a carburetor, a manual choke. It had drum brakes. It had a dynamo. And then for luxury items, it had lights. It had a horn. It had some windscreen wipers that worked some of the time. And it had a fan that, again, worked some of the time. So that was an interesting thing. Now, when I was putting this presentation together, I thought, oh, it would be interesting to see how that actually worked. And so I still had the service manual for my first car, because as my wife likes to point out, I love to keep all sorts of things, really useless things. So I still had the, the service manual for it, and I thought, OK, let's, let's have a look at that. So here is the wiring diagram for my car. So it, it actually looks quite complicated when you think that really all you've got there are some lights and uh, switches and a few things like that. So there's a lot, of, a lot of wiring in that particular car. So let's move forward to today and see what we're dealing with now. So this is my current car. I have an Audi S3, which is again sort of hatchback car. But this time, it has lots of electronics in it. This has really changed in terms of what we have. So rather than having points and a distributor and things like that, it has an engine control unit, which is effectively a computer, which determines how much fuel to allow into the engine when you're accelerating. It has electronic timing. The, the accelerator pedal isn't actually connected mechanically to the engine. So it uses a potentiometer, and it just determines the position that you're pressing it. And then the computer uses that to figure out how much petrol to inject into the car engine. 
It has anti-lock brakes. So the brakes are monitored by another computer, which determines how fast they're going. And if the front wheels go slower than the back wheels, it knows that they're starting to lock up. It has a thing called an electronic stability program, which is very good because it means if you go around a corner too fast, it will actually apply the brakes on one of the wheels to correct for that, and it will hopefully bring you back into line. Um, as a friend of mine liked to point out, because he had a BMW, um, he liked to point out in the, in the manual for the car, it said it has electronic stability program. Please remember this cannot defy the laws of physics. <laughs> Which is quite true, actually. Um, my car is, even has a, a weird thing called magnetorheological suspension which means that the shock absorber is actually filled with a liquid which has like iron filings in it. And then it's got magnets around the, the shock absorber so that you can change the magnetic field and you can change the viscosity of the, the liquid so you can change the suspension. It's got things like satellite navigation, it's got auto-sensing wipers and auto-sensing lights. Great. So thinking about the wiring diagram that we saw for the Mini, which is very complicated, even though there are only a few things. What's the wiring diagram for this one going to look like? Well, the answer is actually looks a lot simpler. There's, there's just no way that you can realistically wire up all of these different things using one wire to each thing and connecting all the different points. It would just be a nightmare. So what car manufacturers do now is they use something that we're familiar with in terms of computing. They use a bus architecture. And that means that you have a, a, like a loop in effect, or a, a line which goes around the car, and then you just plug things into the bus, and you send signals from the devices to other devices as messages. That's is what we're used to doing in computer science. Now, if you look at the car I've got, and in fact Audi's in general, they have three different buses that are used to send signals. So you've got one which is called the convenience bus, and that that has things like the windscreen wipers, the electric windows, the things which are, you know, that type of thing. Then you've got the infotainment bus, and that's the things like the satellite navigation, the telephone integration, all those sorts of things. And then the most interesting one is the powertrain bus. And that's the one that actually connects the computers which control the engine, the braking system, and even the sensors on the steering wheel and things like that. So that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. We're dealing with a bus architecture and being able to send messages to and from the, the different devices. So what I thought I would do is I would build myself a car computer. And I don't quite know how I came up with the idea for this, but I was sort of looking at cars in general and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could gather information from the car about what was going on as I'm driving along. And that's what gave me the inspiration for the Mark I version of the car computer. Now, in terms of the, the design objectives I had for this, really I was looking at having an additional display in the car. So this is the box that I've got here. The idea is that this would sit on top of the dashboard. I'd have a screen that you can see there. And it would display more information than I could get on the dashboard of the car. And what I wanted was real-time data. So I wanted to be able to see what was actually happening as I was driving. And I thought, the kind of things I'd be interested in is, what's the engine performance? You know, how much torque is the engine generating? How much power? What's happening in terms of my driving? So what's the position of the throttle? Where's the steering pointing? How much braking force? Things like that. I also thought it would be interesting to see what the g-forces on the car itself were. So you can see as you go around a corner, how fast you go around that corner. And I also thought it would be interesting to produce some graphs so you could see as you're driving along sort of like a historical set of data based on what you were doing. And so what I came up with was this as an overall architecture. In the middle, is a thing called a Raspberry Pi. Anybody heard of a Raspberry Pi? Oh good, okay. So I don't need to go into too much detail about that. The Raspberry Pi is, is a very nice little computer. It's a single board computer, has an ARM processor on it. Um, the version I used, which was the version one, had half a gigabyte of memory and had various connectors on it. They now do a, a version two, which has a quad core processor and a gigabyte of memory. And it's still about the same price, which is incredible. 
because it's only about $25, $30 for this particular computer. So that was going to be the heart of my computer. And in terms of connecting that up, what I did was I, I bought a screen, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, which connects via the HDMI port on the Raspberry Pi. I had uh, see converter for the power, so I power it off the five, or five volts from the 12 volt car supply. I then had a Wi-Fi dongle because I needed Wi-Fi, and that was going to connect to a thing called an Elm 327, which again we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, which plugs into the car and allows you to find out information about what's actually happening in the car. And then I also put an accelerometer in there, so I connected that using the GPIO pins and a thing called I squared C. So that's the sort of overall architecture of the, the version one. So the, the ELM327 is, is a really interesting little device, and you can buy these on eBay. And certainly in Europe and in the US, and I'm pretty sure here in India as well, that pretty much any car you buy now has a little socket underneath the dashboard where you can plug in, well, what normally happens is you take it to the garage and they plug in a thing and they can determine whether there's any error messages in your car. And so you can buy these on eBay and they provide you with a way of getting access to the information that's going around the buses in your car. So there are two different versions. One is like a Bluetooth version, so you can connect via Bluetooth. The other is a Wi-Fi hotspot version. So I decided to use the Wi-Fi one. Um, it was a little bit more expensive, but not hugely. It was like sort of twenty dollars, I think, for it. What it does, as I say, it connects into what's called the OBD2 port, the onboard diagnostics port, and allows you to get in access to information about what's happening in the car. So in terms of setting that up, it's very straightforward. It had a fixed IP address, used ad hoc networking. So if you modify the etc. network interfaces file on the Raspberry Pi, you can set up the right IP address and you can set up the right type of connection. Um, once you've got that, it uses basically a serial kind of interface and you can send uh, what are called AT commands. So if anybody is old enough to remember modems, then they use AT commands to send the commands to the remote. It's the same idea. And then what you can do is you can simply say, give me information about a particular part of the, the data, and it will send you the information back as serial data. So it's actually quite easy. The, the basics that you get from this are things like engine temperature, you can get engine speed, you can get vehicle speed. There's a whole set of data that's very easily available. You don't have to worry about decoding the complicated stuff that comes from the car. The touchscreen that I used, again, this was something I got on eBay. So I like eBay because there's lots of really good stuff that's not too expensive. And what this was, it's actually designed for a car, so it has a particular fitting that will fit where you normally have the, the entertainment system. And then this one they particularly market for the Raspberry Pi because it does have an HDMI input, so it's very easy to connect it up to the Raspberry Pi. And then the other thing that's really nice is it has a touch screen, so you can get information about where you're touching the screen, and that comes through a USB interface. So it's quite easy to, again, get that information and write an application for it. So this was the, the inside of the first version of my, my touch screen. And as you can see, this has got a couple of interesting points about it. One is there's some nice use of woodwork there. And I'm a firm believer that any good software project should involve woodwork. So I was able to get woodwork into the project. The other thing you'll notice is that there's, there's quite a long cable there, which is the HDMI cable. And I, I did struggle a bit at first to find a short HDMI cable, which is why I've got a one meter HDMI cable, which I've kind of looped around to connect the like, three centimeters, which is actually what it requires. Um, since then, I have actually got a shorter one, so it's better internally now. The accelerometer. This was a nice little sort of device that I got from SparkFun. And what this does is it gives you um, what they call nine degrees of freedom. 
what that means is it gives you an accelerometer, so it'll measure the acceleration in the x, the y, and the z axis. It will also give you gyroscopic data, which means it'll measure how quickly it's rotating in the x, the y, and the z axis. And it will give you a compass, which is designed to work in all three axes, so x, y, and z, which means that it doesn't matter what angle the device is at, you can actually get a bearing for the compass reading. Because the problem is that if you have only one axis for the, the compass, as soon as you start tilting it or rolling it, then it affects the magnetic field and therefore you can't get a good reading. But with this one, because it measures it in all three axes, it will actually take that into account for you and give you a proper reading. It connects through a thing called I squared C, which is again a sort of bus architecture. And the way that you can get that to work is pretty simple. There's some stuff that you use on the Raspberry Pi change the exceptional modules configuration, tell it that you want to use I squared C. I think this is actually now built into the, the Raspbian distribution, but at the time you had to actually configure it. Um, what I got working was I got the, the accelerometer data without any problem. I also got the gyroscopic data without any problem. But the, the compass information did prove to be a bit difficult because it was on a second I squared C bus and I, I couldn't quite get that working. In terms of the code, um, you end up with, with something like this, which uses a library that's been developed as an open source library. There's a thing called Pi4J, which is a really useful little library that allows you to talk to all the different pins on the Raspberry Pi, I squared C, GPIO, um, UART, there's another one, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of different ones that you can use there. And so this is, this is the kind of um, strange um, things that you end up with. You need to know what device it's on, so there's an address um, 68 hex, and then you've got to write some bytes to different addresses to tell it to start sensing. And you can also set the uh, sensitivity of the things like the accelerometer. So the accelerometer will measure um, up to 2G, up to 6G, and I think up to 8G um, as its setting. I figured that for driving my car that up to 2G was probably going to be okay. If my car was going to experience anything up to 6G in terms of force, I'm probably going to be in a big, big heap of trouble. So I would set it to just 2G and that would be okay. And then you can basically just read the information as a sequence of, of values from that. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the, the software architecture, like I said, what I wanted to do was to gather some real-time information. And so I thought, okay, how, how do I want to do that? So I'll have a screens-based interface. So I have a sequence of screens that will display different types of information about what's happening in the car. Start off with a splash screen, so I've got a nice little sort of screen that I can see on there. Um, get some basics, some advanced data, depending on what kind of things I'm looking at, what g-forces are being exerted on the car, and then have some graphs, as I said, so we can see a sort of historic way that the, the actual information is being um, handled. Obviously what we're looking for is a simple user interface, because if you're driving along, you can't really read values. You don't want numbers and, and words, because that distracts you from your driving. Especially if you're driving fast, you don't want to be distracted. So you need something which is going to be clear, easy to glance at, and show you roughly what you're looking for in terms of the, the data. And then in terms of the, the interface, how you work with it, I thought well, let's make it as simple as possible, use the touch screen, and literally just touch the screen to move to the next screen. So you just have to cycle through the screens each time you press it. So there's no complex menus or anything like that to be involved. So then I thought, okay, so how am I going to design this? Now, I'm not a graphic designer, so I'll have a look around and see what other people have done in terms of in-car systems. So the first one I found was, this is from a, a Renault. This is a Renault Megane Sport, um, early version and slightly newer version, where you can get extra information so you can see which gear you're in. Uh, you probably can't read it, but there's things like torque, power, throttle position, turbo boost, and such like. And then the one on the right also has this little picture which shows you how much G-force you've experienced in different directions as you've been driving along. 
Uh, moving up to the scale in terms of, of car systems, this is the, uh, the Tesla. So this is the electric car that they sell uh, mostly in the US at the moment. And I was lucky enough, uh, I, think was, no, I think it was last year, yeah, last year, I was lucky enough to go for a ride in a Tesla. And it's got this whacking great 18 inch um, screen in the middle of the car, which is, which is really nice. It shows you all these pretty pictures of different things that the car's doing and how much energy it's got left and things like that. So I thought, okay, we'll use that as some inspiration as well. And then if you really go up market and look at what people are doing, this is from a Lamborghini. And you start looking at this and you go, okay, this is really exciting to all these lights and things, but I don't actually know what it's showing me. Um, so there's, there's you know, things about what gear I'm in and how much the engine revolutions are and things like that, but there's all sorts of other things that I don't understand there. So I'm not sure that's best um, as a design. So this is what I came up with. Simple, nice and simple. Um, nice simple bar chart, which, yeah, like I said, I'm not a graphics designer, which is clear from this, but it does work. Um, now, the important thing with this was I was using Java FX for the, the graphics display. And because I'm using the Raspberry Pi, what you don't want is really, really big, complicated graphic displays. Because with limited memory in the Raspberry Pi, um, you don't want to try and drive it too hard. So like I said, I end up with this, which literally gives you sort of um, the requirement for about three different nodes. You need a rectangle to represent how much the value is. You need a rectangle to represent the outer box. Um, and then I, you can't actually see it, no, the, the, the color's kind of gone, but there's a, there is actually a red line, which I put in there so you can see the maximum value that it got to um, in any given run. Um, put some labels on it, but those are optional if you wanted it. Um, and like I say, you can see immediately the, the current value with the red line, you can also see the maximum value, and very simple to understand from a glance. So in terms of the UI screens, um, this was the splash screen that I came up with. So what I literally did was I took a photograph of the, the infotainment system in my car, and then I glued the jar, used Photoshop to put the jar logo in there and put Duke on there as well. And that gave me a nice little splash screen. In terms of basic data, what I did was I used my bar chart thing, and then I sort of put five different values there. So I've got engine load, the temperature of the air intake, I've got the catalyst temperature, so that's the exhaust gases, throttle position, and the fuel pressure that's going into the engine as well. And as I say, it gives you some, some basic information about what the car's doing. For the, the G-forces, I came up with this idea, which I sort of based loosely on seeing some of the Formula One stuff. And each of those rings represents half a G. So you can go up to 2G in any particular direction. Um, up down is forward acceleration and deceleration. Left and right is obviously acceleration to the left and to the right. And then I also put a, a bar on the right hand side and that's acceleration in the, uh, I guess, the Z axis, um, which is up and down. So as you go over bumps, you can see the, the car sort of bumping around. So that was, that was the idea of the, the Mark I. And I'll show you that in action at the, at the end when I show you some demonstrations. So then I thought, I did this for job one two years ago. And I thought, okay, let's take this to the next level. What can I do next with this particular project? So this is where the, the Java Computer Mark II came in. And for this, I extended the, the architecture a bit. So I added a, a few more things. And this is what it looks like now. So there's a few more devices in here. So basically in the middle, we've still got the, the Raspberry Pi. I actually upgraded it to a Model B Plus, um, which had more USB ports on it, which was useful. Still got the accelerometer, um, the gyroscope, still got the Wi-Fi connection to the, the ODT2 port. But then there's a whole range of other things I added. Um, one was a video camera, and I'll talk about that um, in a moment because I wanted to include the idea of seeing what was actually happening as you drove along. Um, I added a heart rate monitor, because I thought it'd be fun to see what my heart rate was doing as I was driving. I added a GPS sensor, so I could track the position of the car and also use that for calibrating against speed. 
Um, oh yes, there's some uh, thermal sensors, which we'll talk about in a minute, to uh, have a look at some temperatures there. Um, device for accessing a thing called the CAN bus. So the CAN bus is the one that actually sends all these signals around. And if you want more complex data, that's what you need to use. You need to use the CAN bus to actually get at the raw data. And then I also looked into um, tire pressure monitoring systems. So I, I was, uh, did some work on that as well. But again, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that as we go through. <coughs> so the first thing in a bit more detail was the idea of using a GPS sensor. And I had this sensor which I got from a company called Adafruit, which has a nice little sensor in there. It's quite simple to use. You can actually attach a separate aerial, or you can use the ones on the board if you want. It has 10 hertz read rate, which means it'll read the GPS position 10 times a second. You can get faster ones, but to be honest, for what I was doing, that was perfectly adequate. It has a nice, simple serial interface. So you can just read the data from the serial interface. No problem with that. So you use the UART on the Raspberry Pi. To do that, you have to disable the console, so it's not sending messages to the console. Set it up as 9600 Bode. Again, if you remember modems, 9600 Bode. Eight, uh, eight data bits, no parity, one stop bit. And then use the, the librxtx java library, which allows you to read information from the serial port. What you get is a bunch of comma separated values. So you're looking for different types of messages. And each of them has a little header uh, as part of the message. So there's um, some rather strangely named ones, which is gpgga, which is your position, and gppb, sorry, gp. VTG, which gives you your velocity. Um, one thing I did find was this, with this was that as you're reading it, you did get some corruption of the data. Um, didn't really understand why that was happening, but um, I just wrote my code. So if it got a corrupted message, it would just throw it away and read the next one. Next thing to connect was the heart rate monitor. Um, again, you can buy a nice little board from SparkFun. That works with um, the polar heart rate monitor, so if, if you're in the gym and you use a heart rate monitor, then it's the same kind of idea. Similar interface, serial connection, but this time you connect it using USB, so that's straightforward. Same idea, use the RXTX Java as the library, same uh, boat race and uh, parity and so on. A little bit more complicated in terms of the coding because rather than just reading data continually, you actually have to send a message saying, give me the heart rate and then we'll send it back to you. Um, yes, yeah, so I did have a couple of issues with the wireless connection for this. What I discovered, because originally when I, when I added the heart rate monitor board to this setup, I actually had it mounted in, in this box and it was behind the screen, behind the, um, the Raspberry Pi. And I discovered that the, the range over which you'll read is actually quite short. And so it wasn't really picking up a good enough signal. So in the end, what I did was I mounted it outside the box. And then I was able to pick up a signal without any problem. So that, that was the only thing I had with that. In-car video. So I don't know about in India, but this is actually becoming very common in the UK, is to have a camera in your car recording what's happening at the front of the car. And that way, if you're involved in an accident, you've got video footage that you can give to the insurance company and say, look, it wasn't my fault. It was the other driver who did it. Always the other driver who did it. Um, but you actually have the information that will, will show you the insurance company who was at fault. And so I found this particular device. Um, again, it was, uh, I don't think it was through eBay this time, but uh, I found a particular device. And the, the thing I liked about this was it had a Wi-Fi connection. And you can actually download an app for your phone so that you can connect over a Wi-Fi connection to the, the camera. I've got to admit, I don't really understand why. Why you would want to do that? Because if you think about it, the camera is in the car. Okay. Now, anybody who's actually going to be close enough to connect with their phone to the camera is also going to be in the car. So if they're in the car, why would they want to look at their phone to see what was happening out of the front of the car? Why not simply look out of the front of the car? <laughs> but anyway, 
It served my purpose because it had a Wi-Fi connection. And it had an iPhone app. <laughs> now, this is where things got tricky. Because I thought to myself, OK, so we've got a Wi-Fi connection. How can I get the video from that Wi-Fi connection so I can add it to all the data that I've got in my box? So I actually sent some email to the, the technical support people of the company who make it. I said, you know, you've got an application which downloads video and makes it available. Can I have the details of how to do that? And they wrote back very nicely and they said, no. <laughs> We're not sharing that information with you. It's like, oh, OK, fine. So I had to dig around on their website. I didn't hack it, but I just had to dig around on their website. And I found a, 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 like a zip file which had like um, video codecs and stuff like that. I thought, ooh, okay, great, that, maybe that's the answer. And I unpacked it, and basically it was just a copy of VLC. We used VLC as a, a, a video viewer. So what they'd done is they just used VLC as their basic code. And um, obviously because of the open source license, they had to put a copy of it on their website somewhere. The problem was that that wasn't enough information to actually make it work. So then I started looking at things, and I started digging into it with a uh, thing called Wireshark, which is where you can actually get all the packets that are going across the wireless network and try to figure out what's actually going on. And then I got into like SIN packets and AMP packets, and um, you know, having done a port scan on it, I found various ports that were being used. And at this point, I just thought, no, I, I can't be, you know, there's too much like hard work. There's got to be a simpler way. And there is. There is a much simpler solution. Because effectively, what I wanted to do was capture the video from the camera and synchronize it with the data that I was getting from the rest of the system. So all I needed was to know that when the video started at a certain point, the data started at the same point. How to do that? Well, it actually turns out this <coughs> Because there's a, a well-known system of doing this from like literally dozens, tens of years ago. It's called a clapperboard. They use this in film all the time. And they use it to synchronize the start of a scene. So they know when the audio starts and the video starts at the same time. So what I needed was some kind of, effectively, a clapperboard for my system. So what I came up with was a button. So on my box here, I've got a button. And the idea was, what I did, I had the camera mounted in the car. I put a piece of cardboard in front of the, the camera. Um, set the, the application running, hold the button down on the on the box, and then when I wanted to start both of them, I just move the cardboard so then that the video starts um, and release the, the button. So I know that the data starts at the same time as the video. And that way I can synchronize them and get the video at the same time. So solve that problem without having to do a lot of software. Next thing I thought I'd do was thermal sensors. Now, this is a screen grab from Formula One. I don't know if anybody here watches the Formula One uh, Grand Prix. But they often show you pictures of this so you can see how hot the brakes are and how hot the tires are. And so I looked at this and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if I could put a thermal sensor in the car so I could actually see how hot my, my brakes are and how hot my tires are? So one of the things I found out when I started looking at this is that Formula One have a lot more money than I do. <laughs> so to get a camera to do this cost thousands, thousands of pounds to, to get a camera, even to do like low resolution kind of stuff like this. So then I'm thinking, okay, so what can I do that's a little bit different? So I found these, and these are infrared thermometers, a little board again from Sparkfun, which will you basically point at something and it will read the infrared. Uh, light, if you, if you like, coming from that object and tell you how hot it is. So that was, that was pretty easy, so that's good. So um, I squared C interface, a um, bit, bit of a problem on the Raspberry Pi when I tried to connect this, there seemed to be some issues with that. So it also had a serial interface. So I thought, right, okay, I'll use that instead. And there's another little board you can get, which is an FTDI breakout board. So you can connect it nice, there's like four wires you connect from the breakout board to the thermal sensor, and then you just plug in a USB cable and you can read it over a serial connection. So that, that solved that problem. So then I came up with, okay, I need to read this data. Now, you remember my session yesterday on lambdas and streams? I said that I came up with this piece of code which used lambdas and streams 
with a thermal sensor, a temperature sensor. And this is exactly where I use this. So it's really good because I could use lambdas and strings in my, my project. So um, reading the temperature, obviously I could use uh, the stream set up and that would work quite nicely. And as I say, that's where I discovered that the, this gets injected for you by the compiler. So then we needed to mount the thermal sensors to my car so that we could actually read the temperature of the tires and the brakes. So this is a picture of the, uh, this is actually the front of my car and this is the wheel arch. And I found there was a little spot where I could actually bolt this uh, sensor, so if I put it in a little box and then I bolted it onto the, um, onto the front of the car. Now one of the things I haven't told you is that I don't actually own my car, so it's a lease car. And so the, the real kind of, the big rule about what I was doing with this project was that I mustn't change the car. So there's no drilling holes, no cutting things or anything like that. And I, I, I very nearly succeeded. There was just one bit where I did have to make a very slight change, as we'll see in a moment. But, so this was the idea that um, the sensor would be mounted at the front of the car. It was basically just pointing backwards at the tire in, at the front, so I could measure the temperature of that. For the, the brakes, what I did, and it's a little, probably a little bit difficult to see on the pictures here, but I found there was a little bit of a, a, a the suspension piece that I found, and so I bolted a clamp onto that, and then I mounted the, the sensor so it was pointing at the back of the brake disc, and worked out that when I turned the wheel it wouldn't actually knock it off, so that was all right. And that way I could actually get a, an image, or at least a, a reading of the, the, the temperature of the brakes. So then came another tricky bit, because what I needed to do then was to get the signal from these devices into the car. And to start with, I thought, OK, I'll put a Raspberry Pi, because we're going to use the second Raspberry Pi. I'll put it in the engine bay, and then I can just feed the cables down through into the wheel arch, connect it all up, and then it'll work. So this is sort of, you can just about see there's a kind of, that's the Raspberry Pi there in, in the engine bay. And then what I did was I, I ran a cable, probably just about this little cable there runs from there through the window into the car. So it's, it's not designed to be a permanent fixture, it's just a sort of uh, project kind of thing. Um, yeah, there, so there were a couple of things I had to sort out with that. Um, one of the big problems I had was because I was plugging two sensors in through the USB ports, it was working out which one was which. So one appears as USB 0, one appears as uh, USB 1, so which one is which. So by plugging them in one after the other, I could figure out which was which, and so that, that was easy enough to sort out. Um, <coughs> then I discovered there was a little bit of a problem, because having a Raspberry Pi in the engine bay, what you find is that the internal combustion engine actually generates a lot of heat. So when I went for a drive with my Raspberry Pi in the engine bay, and I then measured the temperature of the Raspberry Pi. This was after about five minutes of driving, ten minutes of driving, and it hit well over 50 degrees Celsius, which is probably not a good idea for prolonged life of the Raspberry Pi. So it was over 50 degrees Celsius, so I needed a new approach. I needed to solve this problem in a different way, and I did that just by basically using longer cables. So I moved the Raspberry Pi into the car, used longer USB cables, and just um, got them to stretch stretch, but got them to, to go as far as the, um, the sensors in the, in the wheel arch. So the next thing was getting data from the CAN bus. Now, like I say, this is where things get really interesting, because you can find all sorts of other details about what the steering angle is, when the brake pedal is being pressed, um, you know, all sorts of different information about that. And so what you need to do is to figure out how to get at that data. Now, in theory, you can do it through the OBD2 port. So if you connect the, the, set the device into that, you should, in theory, be able to read directly from the CAN bus into that device. But I spent a lot of time trying to do that. I eventually discovered that Audi have disabled that feature. So you can't read the data from there. You need to find somewhere else to go for that. So, have a look under the bonnet, and 
i had a look at some of the wiring and i did some research on the, the internet and i found a place at the front of the car where there was kind of a wiring loop which had the right wires for the CAN bus and this is where i got to the point where like i said i wasn't supposed to make any changes to the car but i did make a very small change because what i did was i literally I took the, the wire and i scraped off some of the insulation and then i wrapped a piece of wire around that and then some insulation tape and then I've got a little connector here, so I can connect the CAN bus to that um, through, my, through there. And then I put the oscilloscope on the on there and start the car up. And lo and behold, I actually got data coming from the CAN bus. Um, yeah. So, and the most important thing at that point was the car still worked, which I was very happy about. And so was my wife actually. Now, of course, that's only half the story, because at that point, yes, I've got the electrical signals for the CAN bus. I then connected a sort of device that I bought off the web, which decodes the electrical signals into the actual data that's coming from the CAN bus. Again, it's a USB device, serial device. Um, but this is where things get really complicated, because unfortunately, the nice people at Audi don't provide you with a nice list of all the codes and what they all mean. Because this is very proprietary information and they're very keen for people not to be messing with this kind of information. Because not only can you read all this data, you can also write as well, if you're really brave. So I've, I've, I've done some work on this, but I haven't actually really got very far with this yet. I kind of ran out of time on this project. So it would be nice to go back and actually do a bit more decoding and see if I can get some some other interesting data from that. So this is the um, this is the kind of final setup. This is the um, the inside of my Mark II version. So much tidier wiring here now. And this is the this is the device inside the car. So you can see it on the top of the dashboard. This is the heart rate sensor which I mounted uh, separate, so I get a better reading. And that's the video camera looking out of the front of the car. So the idea now was having all these sensors and having the device there. What I wanted to do was to record lots of information. And now, more than just displaying it whilst I'm driving along, what I also wanted to be able to do is to go back again and replay the data later so that I could do some analysis and see you know, just what a great driver I really am. Maybe. So what I came up with for the idea here was to write a JavaFX application that would display the data for me in different forms so I could see actually what was going on. So I had my video stream, which as I said, synchronized with the data based on using my clapperboard switch cardboard thing. And then I literally recorded all the data onto the SD card for the Raspberry Pi. Very simple approach, comma separated values for each type of sensor one line per sensor, put a timestamp on it, and you know, nice easy way of, of reading all the data in. So when I, when I thought about this, I thought, oh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll read the data into my application, and I'll do a nice little progress bar to show how, the, how much of the data is being read in. And then I found out that reading in 15 minutes worth of data takes about 100 milliseconds. So you don't actually need a progress bar for 100 milliseconds. So I'm just a minor point. In terms of the, the data to display, there's lots of different things you can actually get access to fairly easily. So we've got the video, G-forces, GPS coordinates. Um, then I thought, right, let's use the GPS coordinates and show a map so I can show where the car is on the map. Have the speed both from the car itself and from the GPS so we can see what the difference is, whether there's any like calibration settings there. Um, bearing, engine load, fuel pressure, all the sort of usual things, temperatures and so on, um, and heart rate. So all, all of the idea being to see all this data in one go. So <clears throat> just before I show you the, the demonstrations, um, just a couple of conclusions and resources. Cars can produce a lot of data, and we see this, this idea of the internet of things becoming a lot more common now. And I can see that this is going to become something that becomes more and more common. There'll be lots more data being collected. Certainly in the UK, they're talking about having insurance companies provide, in effect, a black box, which goes in the car. 
and will record all the details about how you're driving, your position, how fast you're going, and so on. And that way, they'll be able to bill you for your insurance based on what kind of driver you really are. So the more dangerous you are as a driver, the more you pay for insurance premium. The better you are as a driver, the lower your insurance <coughs> premium. So there's things like that, but there's also other real-world applications, things like fleet management. So if you've got a, a fleet of cars or a fleet of trucks, then you know there's, there's things like that. Training for drivers. There's all sorts of applications that you can have for this kind of thing. And using Java, JavaFX, does make it very easy to write the kind of code that we need for this. Um, places to go for more information. Um, SparkFun.com is a good place to go. That's got uh, some of the sensors I use. Raj, um, Adafruit is again uh, another supplier that I use for these things. RaspberryPi.org has all sorts of information about the Raspberry Pi and how to program it. And then I have written some blog entries on this. I, I still need to go back and write up some more um, on my blog about this um, and give you some more information that way. So let's have a look at a couple of demos. Now, obviously, you will notice I don't have a car here. So I can't show you actually the car in action because I don't have my car. But what I can do is I can show you a couple of things. Because the way I set things up was, um, even with the first version, I recorded all the information so I could play it back later. And what I can do is I can actually play, I can use the, the same software that would run on the box. And what this will do is it will start up. And okay, the same. There we go. Right. So what you're seeing now is effectively the data that was being recorded in real time just being played back. So you can see that the you know intake temperature is, is what's about 35, 36. Uh, various values are changing as I drive along. Um, if I click on the screen, as I would if I was using the real one, then I've got the advanced data. So this is throttle position, engine speed, torque, and power output. I'm, I'm not quite sure that I've got my torque and power output calculations or either that or my um, calibration correct on that. So I uh, might have to go back and have another look at that. This is the, the G4 sensor. So you can see as we're driving along, there's a little you know, the yellow blob moves around. The green blobs represent the biggest value that I've managed to achieve in any particular direction. So you can see we've gone around the corner and we've got just over half the G on the left hand side. Um, and interesting, we've got, oh yeah, there we go, uh, half a G acceleration going forwards. Um, and then, that one. Um, this is. Throttle position graph, so you can see where I've actually like, um, put my foot down really hard there and also there. Um, other, the rest of the time it's sort of more tame driving, shall we say. And then we've also got uh, like the power output, which probably does need to be calibrated a bit better. Um, and now I had to put a big exit button in there because there's not, otherwise there's no way of getting out of the application. Um, right, so then the other thing I want to show you is, right, so this is the analyzer that I wrote. So if I run this, right, so this is the, the data analyzer I wrote. And yeah, the problem is we don't actually have any red. <coughs> the, uh, the projector is lost into red. And I use red to show the temperatures. But, okay, so this bit here is, is the video, because um, right now, remember, it's covered up by a piece of cardboard, which is why you can't see anything. And this is the map, which um, would show the position. Um, there's also speed, there's GPS coordinates, and also compass, various temperatures there. This is engine data, so it's engine load and fuel pressure. Heart rate would go there if, if you see the red. And then this was something which I, I kind of started working on with the idea that um, when I get some more data, I'll be able to show which gear I'm in. And there's also um, throttle position and engine speed. And the same along the top there. Um, again, I stole a nice little idea from the Formula One way of doing things. If you've seen the um, on the steering wheel of the Formula One car, they have a row of LEDs that shows how fast the engine's going, so at what point to change gear. 
So if I press, oh yes, and you just about see here, this is the um, GeForce sensor as well. So we can see the GeForce playback. Now if I, if I play this, what's going to happen now is, so you're now watching the video from the front of the car as we pull away, and you might be able to see that some of the values change. We've got engine load, we've got fuel pressure there as we accelerate. We get a different fuel load um, that goes up. Um, we see the engine RPM. But that's probably better to look at the top there. You can see the engine RPM changing um, and various things like that. Um, that goes on for quite some time if you want. Um, I'll just pause that. And then the other thing I thought I'd do was actually um, provide graphs of some of the data. So, for example, if we look at, say, vehicle speed and graph that. So that shows the full 15 minutes of driving that we did, and that's the engine speed for over the whole of the 15 minutes. Um, and then there's, there's various other things, so we can look at like throttle position, and so you can see quite, quite a variety of throttle positions there. Um, it was quite an interesting drive, that was. And then the last one that's, that's quite interesting to have a look at was to look at the heart rate of the driver. So as you can see, I'm you know, fairly, fairly steady in terms of my heart rate, it's around about 100. Um, obviously, something exciting happened there, and very briefly, I became very relaxed at this point. <laughs> so, as I say, this is really, it's, it's more of a kind of fun project, just to, to see what you can do with Java event devices, what you can do with Java effects in terms of developing a, a playback application. Um, I hope that's been interesting. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer them. You could make it uh, a label from uh, Audi to something else. Yes, I mean, really all of the data I've got at the moment is not Audi specific because because I'm using the, um, the L327. There's certain values that always are available for the car and that's for, um, they use it for emissions control. So they can check certain values to make sure that the car is not uh, pumping out too many fumes. So you always get those values available. So it should work with pretty much any car. Um, it's only when you start getting into the CAN bus stuff that you will actually need to, to make it Audi specific or um, you know, BMW or Toyota or whoever. Part 1 and Mark 2. Part 1 was the Audi Oh, right. Um, well, I suppose in terms of how much I've spent on this, the most expensive part was actually the screen, because that was about, I think I paid about £100 for that. So what's that? That's 10,000 rupees, is it? About that. Yeah, I think about 10,000 rupees for that. The rest of it was all quite cheap. I mean, it was literally, so everything else was sort of maybe 10 or £20 pounds, uh, for the different pieces. So obviously it adds up when you put them together. But um, it, it wasn't too expensive. So I probably spent about three hundred pounds total on all the different bits for it. Is it patented? Can I copy it? No, it's, it's not patented. <laughs> You're more than welcome to copy it. Absolutely. So regarding Mark II, I had a question. Uh, you said uh, for the thermometer, I, I couldn't see the slide number, but uh, you had the two small boards. Yes. Uh, you said you had some mismatch, uh, they were talking to each other. So my question was, how did you resolve that? Um, so as I said, the, the problem I had was, was recognizing which one was which. Because when you plug them in, they appear as slash dev slash TTY USB 0 and USB 1. So all I had to do was boot the Raspberry Pi up with one of them connected, and then I knew that that would be TTY USB 0. And then the second one I would connect after I boosted it, and that was going to be a TTY USB one. So then I knew which one was which. Because if I boosted them up, boosted it up with both of them connected, sometimes they'd be they'd swapped over. So it was just easy enough to, to plug it in once the machine boot it up. <laughs> Idea for Mark Three? Um, not yet. I think really I, I need to keep working on the Mark Two. And like I said, the CAN bus is the thing that I really would like to, uh, to kind of delve into and try and get some more information from that. Because uh, I think there could be some quite a lot of fun to <coughs> have the information from, from that kind of thing. I was also thinking, uh, any other electronic signals 
Um, no, you see, the, the, this is an interesting thing about car electronics, is that the, the standards that they have to operate to are way harder than you have with, with consumer electronics, because they have to be able to stand up to much higher levels of vibration, much higher temperatures, uh, much colder temperatures, you know, um, much more electronic interference, so they, they have to be really rugged, which is why companies like Bosch, who are like very big in, in terms of car electronics, spend an awful lot of time developing specific hardware for cars, which is very different in terms of its performance to what you'd see in consumer electronics. Sorry? Oh, where am I driving here? Uh, this is this is in a place called Guildford, um, just outside of London. So actually, because it was a, a friend, I, I got my friend to help me, so I drove around to his house and then we went for a drive around uh, where he lives. <coughs> No, he's asking, where do you save the data? Where, where do you store it? Oh, I see. So the um, the camera itself has an SD card in it. So it saves the data onto an SD card. So I, I, I just took the SD card out, put it in my uh, laptop, took the video files off, then looked for the point where it um, where I moved the cardboard away, and then just trimmed the video so it started at that point, and then so I just made it into one video file. Uh, interestingly, actually, that, that's something I didn't say. Um, what I discovered was, I, I synchronized the start of the video, and then I found that um, even though I knew how frequently I was taking readings, so I just calibrated it for that, what I then discovered was that, yes, I knew how frequently I was taking the readings, but I hadn't taken into account the fact that it also took some time to process those readings. So that, that I had to kind of um, stretch things out a little bit, so I put a fudge factor in to make the video fit with the data because I hadn't taken into account the actual processing of the data. Um, but I sorted that out in the end. Because what I found originally was I ran out of data before I ran out of video. What was the average time frame? I, mean, um, I took readings 10 times a second. So it was 10 hertz. And the, the video was at 25 frames a second. So uh, it's just, you know, uh, it doesn't matter the fact that they're different frame rates or different Right. Do you have any performance issues with Raspberry Pi having the video and these many sensors? Um, no, because remember the video wasn't actually handled by the Raspberry Pi. So the video was just copied onto the SD card of the camera. Um, but the Raspberry Pi was fine in terms of gathering all the data. I didn't have any performance issues with that. Even when I was running the, the JavaFX application in Mark 1, I didn't have any problems with performance. It worked um, fine. There's, there's plenty of performance there to process the data. If you have to push this particular set of the data over to the cloud, what additional thing would you require? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that you could do that. You could certainly push the data into the cloud as you're driving along. Um, because the amount of data, as I say, was being gathered, if you look at the, the, the real volume of data, it's actually not that high. And you could certainly even apply a compression algorithm to it very easily and shrink it down even further, because I'm just using raw text. You could easily squash that down using uh, a simple compression algorithm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Is this the uh, Java FX? Yes, this is Java FX. Yeah. Anything else you could use? Any other languages? Uh, yeah, I suppose you could. Um, it's just a lot easier using Java FX, because you've got all the animations, um, and all the effects and things. So, you know, doing things like this where I put a translucent background on there, overlaying it on top of the video, um, actually becomes quite easy to job effects. Yeah. Is there a Sorry, I can't. Is this the permission Yes, like I say, I, I put some of it on my blog. Um, what I need to do is actually put the rest of it on my blog so that, because um, I'm, I'm quite happy to make the code available. Um, I probably, what I need to do is put the code up on GitHub. Um, so people can download it from there. Okay. Hey, just a couple of things. Uh, yesterday evening, those who did not stay back, uh, Renard had sent across teachers for all of you. So 